title of the sermon this morning is Honor the Son, Honor the Son. And we've come to John chapter 5, we're working through this glorious chapter in John's gospel, and we've come to verse 16 now, on the heels of the healing of the lame, paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. And we came to recognize from last week, as we worked through that passage, the opening 15 verses, that this account in the first 15 verses of chapter 5 didn't just happen by accident. It wasn't just something that happened per chance, that the Lord directed this account to happen. God, in his providence, brought it about. Now, you think about that for a moment. For what purpose? For what reason? God brought it about for a reason. Here's an encounter in chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, where the Lord Jesus Christ heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath. He heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath. Contradicting all of those who say that the Gospel of John doesn't teach repentance, Jesus then goes to him and says, sin no more, that's repentance, sin no more, that's the worst thing to come upon you. And so he tells this lame man who he just healed, and then what does that lame man do? What does the healed man do? He goes off and tells the Pharisees, turning Jesus Christ over to his enemies, turning Jesus Christ over to the Jewish opposition. So now our text today begins in verse 16, and it begins with these words, for this reason, for this reason, the Jewish opposition persecuted Christ, and then sought to kill him. For what reason exactly did they do that? Well, they did that because he had done these things, the Bible says, on the Sabbath. Now, what are the specific things, the these things that the Bible is referring to? One, he told a man to pick up his mat, basically telling him to carry a burden on the Sabbath. So he considered that a work. The next thing that he did was that Jesus himself also worked on the Sabbath when Jesus healed the lame man. So he himself worked, he told someone else to work, and the Pharisees are uh, uptight about that. So now, there are many different ways that this could have been taken care of, many different ways that the Lord could have approached this. He could have, one, he could have corrected their just unbiblical application of the law, their unbiblical idea of what the Sabbath is all about, their unbiblical laws and rules and regulations that they had added, but he didn't do that. And that's sort of where we come to the purpose of our account here, the purpose for the way that the Lord directed this encounter. He chose to use this encounter, chose to use the lame man that was healed, and now the, the discussion that follows from verse 16 all the way through verse 47, he uses this as an opportunity for him to reveal something about himself to us. Now that goes hand in hand, remember, with the purpose for John's writing. John says that he wrote in chapter 20, verse 31, says that he wrote the gospel of John that we might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life in his name. So the purpose now for which Jesus Christ enters into this encounter with the Pharisees is for the purpose of revealing something about himself. And that we're going to see today is that we should honor the son and honor the son for many reasons. This section of scripture that we're now concerned with is one long monologue of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the more glorious discourses of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of the New Testament. And we're going to get a lot from these verses. They are power packed with revelation of who Jesus Christ is. This one runs from verse 16, like I said, all the way through 47. And we're going to take it one chunk at a time, okay, in the, in the, the next several weeks. And in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, we're going to learn glorious truths about what he is, who he is, what he's done. So we're looking forward to this passage of scripture. As we get into our text today, we're going to see three primary reasons that we should honor the Son. Those words, honor the Son, that exhortation, that command, comes from the end of our section in verse 23. There are three primary reasons that we should honor the Son. One, we should honor the Son because He is Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of the Sabbath. He is certainly Lord over you and I in every possible way. But He is Lord of the Sabbath. Two, He is equal with God. Many ways that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reveal that here, and that is very important, and it's certainly not missed on the part of the Pharisees. They know what he's saying. Make no doubt about it. He is equal with God. And then thirdly, he is God the Son. He is God the Son. This is a, a glorious picture of the deity of Christ. It's a glorious picture of the equality of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Father. It's a glorious picture of the Trinity and the work of the Trinity and redemption. Uh, it's just a glorious passage of scripture. I'm looking forward to getting into it. So let's take a look at point one on your notes. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, we're in John chapter five, verse 16, where the Bible says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. 
But Jesus answered them and said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. So again, verse 16 begins. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Why? Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And what are the these things he's talking about? At a basic level, the these things are that he violated their man-made rules about working on the Sabbath. The taking up of the mat, right? The healing of the lame man were works that were done on a Sabbath in violation of God's rules? No, of their man-made hypocritical false religious rules. Uh, and then he, in him breaking the Sabbath, he led someone else to do the same thing. And this guy picking up his mat and carrying it. Underlying that, put that in context for a moment and think about it. Underlying that is a lot of context and it's a lot of disdain and disregard for them, for the Pharisees. That's the way they viewed it. When the Lord did this, he is, in a sense, taking control out of their hands. He's thumbing his nose at the authorities in the temple. He's spitting in their face, so to speak, and their rules regarding the Sabbath. They saw themselves as in control. And here this rebel comes along now and challenges their authority. Not only does he challenge their authority, but he does it in the sight of the people. And so they feel threatened, they feel intimidated, they feel defensive, and they are, of course, self-righteous hypocrites themselves. And so how do they result? How do they react? They lash out of the Lord Jesus Christ, persecute him, and seek to kill him. Jesus has been a thorn in their side. By this point, a thorn in their side for quite some time. This is no mere disagreement. We can't look at it like just a disagreement. They see him as a threat. They see him as a threat to their authority, but also a threat to their entire religious system. He, at the point, at the very heart of their religion, so to speak, he's challenging them and pressing them about their authority. He's been baptizing, and we know from his baptism that he's been baptizing more than John the Baptist did, and that people are coming out to follow him. They're following him around. During Passover week, here just a couple of chapters back, he cleared the temple, showing extreme power, showing his extreme authority in the face of their false religion and clearing out the temple all by himself. The verbs here, even in the Greek, if you look at the original language, mean that they had an immediate reaction to what he's done. And then after the, his, their immediate reaction, they continued, they persevered, if you will, in their hostility toward him and in their plots to kill him. Eventually that's gonna lead to his, obviously his persecution and ultimately to his crucifixion. This shows you, in this particular encounter, in this context, the insane hostility of self-righteous people when they're confronted in their sin and in their hypocrisy. It's basically what the Lord is doing here. He's confronting them in their sin and in their hypocrisy, and they react with hostility. They don't have the truth. They've got the Word of God, the Old Testament, in their hands, and yet they don't understand the truth. And even without the truth, that doesn't stop them from running off and cohorting with their other Pharisees and persecuting and plotting to kill the Lord. So those words, for this reason, beginning in verse 16, are loaded with context, right? We've seen some of that context as we work through the Gospel of John. Combine that thought for a moment with the idea that this encounter didn't happen by accident. We've stated that. Combine that with the fact that Jesus caused, in his providence, caused this encounter to come, apart, to come about. And by purposefully encountering the lame man, seeking him out, and then healing him on the Sabbath. He could have healed him on a Friday, right? Healed him on a Sunday, but he chose to heal him on the Sabbath for this purpose. He chose to begin this conflict. In that, you see the boldness of the Lord, right? You see the boldness, the power, the authority of the Lord in standing up to their so-called authority, right? with real authority, taking a stand for righteousness. And like I said, he goes right at the heart of their system, right at the heart of their false religion, right at the heart of their self-righteous hypocrisy. He goes to one of the most important of their religious observances, the Sabbath observance. Now the people were astonished with Christ. The Bible says they were astonished with his teaching because he spoke as one having authority. But here he's not just speaking with authority, he's acting with authority. He in his person and the way that he is conducting this is acting with tremendous authority. And it would be wise for them to heed that, which they don't do. And he's here in the face of temper tantrum throwing hypocritical Pharisees, right? Demonstrating again that all authority belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, had the Lord Jesus Christ broken their laws on the Sabbath, 
Yes, he broke their laws on the Sabbath. Had he broke God's laws? No. In fact, we see from Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. We see that here in how the Lord responds. We see this throughout Scripture, that the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. And I want to show you another place and do a little comparison and contrast with you. Turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. The Lord Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. They presumed, and the way that they applied their rules and regulations, they presumed that they themselves, the Pharisees, were lords of the Sabbath in the burdens and in the regulations that they placed upon people. And the Lord Jesus Christ has to come through and correct that. Here in Matthew 12, he corrects it one way. John chapter 5 corrects it another way. But the truth is, is that the Lord is Lord over the Sabbath. Matthew chapter 12, and look at beginning at verse, beginning at verse 1. Now again, here in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is making a point on the Sabbath. And if you'll notice, Jesus does that often. It's a pretty common occurrence. He makes it a pattern to challenge these self-righteous uh, Pharisees on the Sabbath. He's always jumping up and down on that one nerve, right? Pressing that one hot button. And he does it here again, Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. So now, walking through the grain field, plucking heads of wheat to eat, were they breaking God's law concerning the Sabbath? No. They weren't breaking God's law. They were breaking the Pharisees' law. But they weren't breaking God's law. The law said in Exodus 34, that's where that's introduced, the law said in Exodus 34 that you weren't to reap on the Sabbath, that you weren't to bring in the harvest. You'd wait till Sunday to do that, wait till Monday to do that, but don't do that on the Sabbath. However, as in, it is common in Scripture, the, the rabbis come along and load that up with all their man-made traditions and all their man-made rules and regulations. So the rabbis came in and said, if you're walking through the grain field and you pluck a, a, a head of wheat off a stalk to eat, that to rub it between your hands to separate the wheat from the chaff is threshing. And then to separate the chaff over so that you could eat it is called winnowing. So they're bringing in the harvest. That was the rabbinical law attached to this particular understanding of Scripture. Crazy, right? Again, false religion, man-made rules and regulations. It's interesting that using this very example, that God, in his word, with much grace, with much mercy, much compassion, made allowance in Deuteronomy 23 for Jesus and the disciples to do this very thing. That someone could pass through the grain fields, pluck heads of wheat, and eat them when they were hungry. And the Lord said, they weren't to fill all their baskets, right, from somebody else's field. But the Lord, made, in his grace and his mercy, made provision to, for them to do this very thing that the Pharisees then, in their wicked legalism and their false religion, took away with their rules and regulations. Do you see that? So look at verse 2 now. Here come the Pharisees, right? When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, you're just, you know, it, it makes me think, what were the Pharisees doing out there? You're like, you're on the highway, right? And you're, you're following the speed limit and there goes the police officer right by you, right? Is, what were these guys doing? In the, they were probably doing the same thing. They're out there eating. When they come along, the, Phar, the Pharisees said to them, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. One of the, the, the terrible despicable, disgusting, joyless, heartless effects of the heresy of legalism is that you go, you go beyond God in calling something sin that God himself has not called sin. And you rob someone of their joy. You play the judge over them. Many of you will hear that around this time of year. You know, it's a sin for you to observe that holiday. People say that. Is that in God's word? Or they'll say, it's a sin for you to watch that movie or to eat that food or to do this, that, or the other thing. And they go farther than God does in condemning someone in sin where the Lord God Almighty has not called it sin. We've got to be really, really, really careful not to fall into either of the two ditches of either legalism or licentiousness. Be careful not to judge your brother. We have Christian liberty and it's according to our understanding of the word of God with our informed conscience that we have to make decisions about those things. But we have to avoid legalism, have to avoid licentiousness. It's interesting here that beyond verse two into verse three, that now the Lord Jesus Christ gives us three examples of how the Sabbath was made for God's glory and for man's good. 
and gives us three examples of how this is for man. Listen to verse 3. But he said to them, Jesus responded to their hypocrisy, responded to their legalism by saying to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Now, this is a, a tremendous um, insult to them. He was mocking the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew their Old Testaments. They had memorized large chunks of it, knew it very well, had studied for lifetimes, right? So this is very sarcastic. They consider themselves experts in the scriptures. But Jesus said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, Verse four, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat. Now, is this a, a real law in God's word? Yes. He goes from a hypocritical man-made false law that the Pharisees had come up with to now bringing up what is an actual law in God's word. David wasn't to go through and eat the showbread. The showbread was for the priests, not for anyone else. And so David, having been hungry with he and his men, went into the priest at that time, which, who was uh, Ahimelech, and Ahimelech gave them the showbread to eat to satisfy their hunger. They were in a desperate situation, if you know that passage of scripture. He says, how he entered the house of God, verse four, ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. This would be considered an act of necessity. His men were hungry. They were being chased. And Ahimelech the priest gave him the showbread. It's interesting in that passage of scripture that God neither condemns or deals with in any way Ahimelech or David for that encounter. God was merciful. God was compassionate. God showed great grace to David and those men in this act of necessity to take care of their hunger. But then it goes beyond that. Look at verse 5. Or have you not read, again, sarcastic, right? Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? So here he brings up, one, an act of necessity, feeding David and his men the showbread. Secondly, service to God. The priests in the temple work and serve the Lord. I'm working. There are many people here that work, and we work all day on, on, on Sunday, the Lord's Day, work serving the Lord. Many of you work serving the Lord. When you go home to prepare a fellowship meal, what a, a beautiful blessing, right, fellowship with God's people is. So someone's working to prepare a fellowship, to set the house, to set the table. We do that as, a, as an act of service to the Lord in caring for and loving God's people, right? Here, this is an example of this in the scripture. Look at verse six. Jesus says, Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. Now, you got to put that in perspective. The, the Jewish people at the time thought that there was nothing that was greater than the temple than God himself. So for Jesus to make this statement, it's a tremendous, a profound statement of his deity. Jesus is saying that one who is greater than the temple standing here before you, he's calling himself equal again with God. And they didn't miss that. This is a statement of his deity, right? So verse seven, so this is the person who's now confronting them, who's confronting them in their hypocrisy, confronting them in their ignorance. This is one greater than the temple who in verse seven says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Again, he points them back again to the word of God, to the word of God, to the word of God, to the word of God. These Pharisees who had been studying the word of God, who thought themselves to be experts in the word of God. That's, um, that's an exhortation to you and I also, isn't it? We've got to constantly stay meticulously faithful to the word of God. And you, the analogy of the faith, allow scripture to interpret scripture. You work yourself through the word of God so that you understand it and how to apply it. These Pharisees just missed the boat in its application altogether because of their pride, because of their false religion, because of their hypocrisy, twisting the scriptures, going beyond God, loveless, heartless, joyless religion. Where all the time in this very example in Matthew chapter 12, we see God in accord with his nature, in accord with his character, being merciful, being compassionate, being loving, it's just tremendous grace on the part of God in the Sabbath. And that's what we want to talk about more today. We see here acts of mercy, acts of compassion are to be expected on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees here, again, in their legalism, condemning those who were not in sin. That's the, the MO of the legalist, right? You know, find sin in you in the way that you're living, uh, rob you of your joy and your freedom in Christ. God here 
goes in accord with his nature and provides mercy and compassion. Merciful to man, with here the backdrop being the Sabbath. But then the Lord, in verse 8, expresses the authority that he has again to teach such things. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And again, Son of Man, a claim to his deity, right? So back in John chapter 5, back in John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5 could have handled this encounter with the Pharisees about the Sabbath in the same way. He could have used it as an opportunity to instruct them, an opportunity to call out their error, to explain to them why it wasn't sin to carry your mat on the Sabbath. He could have gone through and instructed them, but he chose to do it a different way. Instead, he sets about making the point in John chapter 5 that he is the Lord of the Sabbath in a different way. And the way that he explains this and expresses it is that he is Lord of the Sabbath because he himself is God in the flesh. He himself is equal to God in every sense. The sense that he works when God works. He has the power of life over death. In fact, God has committed all judgment into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is sovereign. Jesus Christ is powerful as God is powerful. He sets off to explain this fact. He is Lord of the Sabbath because he is equal with God. We're going to see that as we work through this paragraph. It's an awesome paragraph of scripture. Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. Now, the fact that he is Lord of the Sabbath, he makes this statement in John chapter 5 verse 17 that is tremendously shocking. In fact, it's one shocking statement with several very shocking components. Verse 17 says, Jesus answered them and said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. That is a loaded, loaded statement. One component is this. Jesus calls God my father. That truth wasn't missed by the Pharisees. They knew exactly what he was saying. And again, it's one of those things that caused them to persecute him and eventually led to his crucifixion. It was for the sin of blasphemy that the Pharisees charged him. And that came from statements just like this. But next, Jesus also says that both he and his father have been working. It's yet another statement in one phrase here, what, he's just really poking them in the eye. In one phrase, he makes another statement of equality that he and his father are both working, meaning that they're working in the same fashion. Again, a statement of equality. And then lastly, that work that they're both doing is implied here is going on on the Sabbath until now. And so the work that's been happening, the work that he's equal to the father in, all that work has been going on every Sabbath. Sabbath in and Sabbath out now until this very point, and it continues today. That brings up an interesting fact, and it's something to think about. It's something that the Pharisees had to think about. Let's think about it together, too. Considering the Jewish laws about working on the Sabbath, and considering the fact that God the Father, in the same way that Jesus Christ is now in this encounter working on the Sabbath, does that mean that God the Father is a Sabbath breaker? <laughs> It's interesting. Interesting because God obviously doesn't break any of his laws. God is perfectly in tune with his own character. Interesting to consider that with the Pharisees and their man-made religious traditions that they had to find a way around God breaking their man-made rules too. You know, we can't have a Sabbath breaking God who breaks all our man-made traditions about the Sabbath. Hebrews 1 says that God, Lord Jesus Christ, upholds all things by the word of his power. So from the time of creation until now, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been sustaining all things by the word of, the, of word of his power. Not a single stray molecule out of place in the entire universe because of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord Jesus Christ or God stopped sustaining all things by the word of his power, if he just took a breath for a moment, we would all cease to exist. The Lord sustains everything in its existence by the word of his power. So does that mean then that God is a Sabbath breaker? No. The Pharisees couldn't have a God though that went around breaking their man-made laws. So they figured out innovative ways around this. One of the ways that they did it was to say this. Think about this. Since God is omnipresent, right? Since he's everywhere at once, he inhabits the entire universe. And so it's not possible then for God to carry a burden from one place to another. 
It's ridiculous. They actually came about with a way, an understanding that God wasn't a breaker of their Sabbath laws because he's omnipresent. He can't carry a burden. So he gets around our legalistic laws. God is higher than anyone else, anything else. And so God could never lift a burden higher than himself. So he didn't break that law either. It's crazy. The rabbis had dealt with this one idea from this statement that the father had been working. But what they didn't get, what they hadn't dealt with now is the fact that Jesus Christ trying to make himself equal with God. They hadn't dealt with him. And they hadn't dealt with his claim now that he's working in the same way that the father is working. They hadn't dealt with that. They had a major problem with that. And we're gonna deal with that as we walk through the passage. So let's take a look at the Sabbath now and what the Sabbath issue is. And let's praise the Lord, right? That we can honor the son, the Lord of the Sabbath and that we don't have Sabbath police like these Pharisees over us, right? Go with me to Genesis chapter one. Let's take a look at the issue of the Sabbath. Genesis chapter one. This is good for us to take some time and understand. We'll do that in a cursory way today and get into more depth on this later. But important for us in this context to understand what is the right way to view the Sabbath. How did the Lord view the Sabbath? What's the Sabbath for? Look at Genesis chapter one. The Bible says in verse 31 here that after God had created everything, right? God has finished, completed his work of creation. And so Genesis chapter one, verse 31 says this. Then God saw everything that he had made and indeed, it was very good. God took joy in his creation, amen? Everything was very good. Then he says, so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. When I go into chapter two, verse one here. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, the Sabbath, right? God ended his work. What work? He ended his work of creation. So for the first six days, those are six literal days. Is God omnipotent, able to create all things that we know and see in six literal days? Yes. Again, by the same word of his power. Why argue with scripture? The Lord can do this. Amen. The, the Bible says it. So believe it. The Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days. And on the seventh, he rested from all his work, which he had done. Verse three. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. In other words, he set it apart. He set it apart from the other six days that he was creating in. So he set apart, he sanctified the seventh day because in it, he said there, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So here in Genesis chapter two, we see instituted in the form of an ordinance here, a Sabbath rest. Not that God stopped working. Did he stop working then? No, he goes on sustaining, right? And now today, praise God, he's working in redemption to draw in his elect. Here, he sets forth, he finishes his work of creation and he sets forth an ordinance for a Sabbath rest. He took joy in his creation. He took pleasure in what he had done in creating everything that we, we know and see. He took joy, he took pleasure in that. So he took that Sabbath rest as enjoyment, as fulfillment in what God had done, as pleasure. God rested on the seventh day in the, sen in the sense that he stopped his work to enjoy it. God rested to take pleasure in creation, but didn't stop working. Now, again, he sustains all things, not a stray molecule in the universe. He works in history to direct the affairs of men, right? To execute his decrees. Even now, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit works in redemption to secure redemption for his own. That's also the sense in which uh, Jesus in John chapter five, verse 17, says that he works until now. But notice something else interesting here. At the end of the seventh day, there's no completion given or close given to the day. Look at Genesis chapter one, let me just draw your attention to something. Down in verse eight, look at what the Lord says there. And God called the firmament heaven, and then he completes the day. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Look down at verse 13. Or oh, in 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Down in verse 13, so the evening and the morning were the third day. We see a close there. You drop down to verse 17. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, 
to rule over the day, over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. Verse 19, so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 23, so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Right, so you see the pattern. But now we don't see that in Genesis chapter 2 regarding the seventh day. It doesn't close it out. It's not a, a completed, so the morning and the evening or the evening and the morning were the seventh day. It's interesting that this Sabbath rest points forward. It points forward to the eternal rest that every believer will enjoy in the Lord. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to go to heaven, praise the Lord. We're going to en enter into the eternal rest of the Father. We see the Sabbath, or we see God's rest, referred to often in Scripture as a rest. Uh, you remember the Israelites in the wilderness, how God was angry with them. So in his wrath, he swore they would never enter his rest, right? Hebrews chapter 3, Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us take heed that no one falls short of it. This is speaking of an eternal rest. It's pointing forward to an eternal rest that we're going to have by virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've turned from your sin, you put your faith and trust in him, you'll one day enter into a glorious eternal rest of the Lord. It's why there's work now, right? When the Lord Jesus Christ said, just as my father is working, I also am working. Well, listen, just as our father in heaven is working, just as the Lord Jesus Christ is working, you and I need to be about the work of the Lord. We need to be working. There's a time coming for rest. Now's not that time. Now's the time to serve the Lord, work for the Lord, serve the Lord. But in a picture of this rest that the Lord institutes here in Genesis, we're going to glorify God, enjoy God, take pleasure in God for all of eternity. What's the chief end of man, according to our catechism? That's right. Glorify God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's what our eternal rest is going to be about. That's the, the purpose for which we are created, to enjoy God, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, to worship him for all eternity, to take joy, our complete and total and utter, complete and utter and complete satisfaction being completely and utterly in God. This is an awesome thought. Free from sin, this is going to be glorious. Here, this rest points forward. It is a, a foretaste, if you will, of that rest. That's the reason that God instituted the Sabbath for man. Not man for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. We're to enjoy God, take pleasure in God, meditate on God, take delight in him, and look forward to our eternal rest in him. And what a blessing that will be. Believers are commanded then, in light of this, to set apart, set apart from the other six days of the week to set apart a Lord's Day observance, a rest, by which it is a foretaste of glory divine, by which we are to enjoy the Lord, take pleasure in him alone, delight ourselves in him alone, and worship him that one day a week that is sanctified, set apart to him. We enjoy God fully, apart from the work that we do the other six days, enjoy him fully on that day. There's this is one, if you think about it now, one of several reasons why the Sabbath did not go away when Christ came and fulfilled the other ceremonial laws. There are those that think that there's no such thing as a Sabbath observance today because the Sabbath was a ceremonial law in the Old Testament that went away in Christ. If you think about it, the ceremonies were fulfilled in Christ, right? When someone would go and they would sacrifice a lamb in the temple, that was a ceremony that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Passover pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. These festivals, in many cases, their rituals, the things that they did pointed, they were types and shadows that pointed to their ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here the Sabbath is a part of the moral law of God, one of the 10 commandments, the fourth commandment. And the Sabbath didn't point to ultimate fulfillment in Christ. The Sabbath rest points beyond Christ into the eternal state that we'll enter into by virtue of Christ, but it points to our eternal rest with God. That's why the Sabbath wasn't done away with. It doesn't, it's not fulfilled. The Sabbath wasn't fulfilled in that sense in Christ. The Sabbath points to our eternal rest. And so it's still pointing that direction today. When we talk about coming to church, fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters, hearing the word of God preached, if you're a genuine Christian, you delight in those things. 
You take joy in them. Your affections are set on the Lord. You love God's people. You love his word. So these things aren't burdensome. They're just pointing you forward to look forward to what we're going to have in heaven. And that, that Sabbath, that Christian Sabbath that we now enjoy is a foretaste of that. It's pointing, it's still today pointing forward. Can you feel it? Right? I mean, we come together, we enjoy our worship together. And, and I think to myself, what's that going to be like in heaven? I mean, I love our singing. I love our fellowship. But can you imagine the, the heavenly choir? <laughs> I'll be singing with a sanctified voice. Somebody can stand next to me and not get annoyed. It's going to be awesome, you know. So I wish to look forward to that. It didn't go away. It didn't go away. This points forward. It still points forward. It's going to be fulfilled one day. We look forward to that. We need to take warning from Hebrews, though. It's chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest... Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. If you, if you enjoy the Lord on the Lord's day, take pleasure in him, you take delight in the things of God, um, you think about how glorious it is to worship him, how much you want to be pleasing in his sight, free from sin, how much you just want to worship him, right, in a way that is befitting him, that is worthy of him. All those glorious thoughts. Um, and take heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Fear, lest you come short of that ultimate rest. This life is a vapor. It is passing away. Serve the Lord. Make good decisions. Prioritize the Lord, especially on the Lord's day. Delight in him, serve him. Your time is short. The rest is coming. So you don't, you see the tape, right? Across the finish line. You don't back off and slow down. You press into it. <laughs> the people of God take heaven by force. You press into it. Don't fall short. This is a picture of the Sabbath, this glorious blessing, this glorious mercy, grace, compassion of the Lord. Can you see how the Pharisees just wickedly perverted and corrupted this, right? How wicked that is. This is a glorious promise. It is a mercy of God. It is a compassion. It is a grace of God. It's the love of God toward us that he gives us one day of rest per week, sanctified from the others, whereby we just enjoy him. It's to be that way. Mark says in his gospel, in chapter two, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Do you see that? Made for man. Any approach to the Sabbath, any approach to the Sabbath that results in undue burden, any approach to the Sabbath that ladens on all the laws and rules and regulations, misses the point altogether. Now let me ask you, are there commands for us related to the Sabbath from scripture? Yes. Are those commands burdensome? No, and the reason that they're there is so that we can experience the joy that the Lord intends for us on his day so that we can experience the pleasure and joy that we have in delighting in him. The Lord wants that for us. I get excited when um, someone new comes to our church. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what a tremendous blessing this church has been in my life. The blessing that it's been to my family, my marriage, my kids. This is such a grace of God. And so when someone new comes through, I'm like, you know, it's gonna be a blessing to you too, buddy. You just hang in there. <laughs> it's just, it's a joy, right? That's what the Lord wants for us from the Sabbath, from our worship of him, is that kind of enjoyment. He's like in love and compassion and grace toward us, his people. He wants that joy, that pleasure, that enjoyment for us in him the chief object of our delight. The only one that we can be fully satisfied in is the Lord. And so he wants that for us. That's the reason for those commands. It's the reason that those commands are burdensome. These are designed to lead us into the joy of focusing on him. Go with me very quickly. Actually, just listen to it. Just listen to it. This is Exodus chapter 20, verse eight. This is the moral law of God, which has not gone away. And the Sabbath being one of those moral laws. It says, listen to this from the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And up comes the legalist, non-Christian, hypocritical, self-righteous, whatever they are. And they say, oh, got to keep the Sabbath. Can't do it. I have football games on. I feel guilty when I watch a football game. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's not the heart that God intended with the observance of this day. It's not what the Lord intends in his word. This is a part of the, the moral law of God. Like I said, James says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point of it is a violator, is a breaker. He's guilty of all. This is a part of the moral law of God. Is this intended to be burdensome? No. We need to remind ourselves of that. Go to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Just look at the, the mercy and grace of God in this. Isaiah chapter 58, look down at verse 13. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. There's an admonition to us in this. Um, there's a warning here, there are commands. Are you in sin for breaking commands? Yes, it's sin to break a command of the Lord. But again, in all of the commands of God, we see the same kind of blessing, the same kind of hope, the same kind of heart of God for our good. That's all of the command. And sometimes in our flesh, we have such a, a wicked view of the commands of God. Um, let me ask you this. Is it legalism to uphold God's standard for holiness? Never. Right. Amen. Never. Is it legalistic to uphold man's standard? I mean, yeah. Those things outside of scripture, of course. Here in Isaiah 58, listen to the words of this in verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath. Now listen, this is a warning. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then there's a blessing attached in verse 14. Let's look at verse 13 for a moment. It's pretty straightforward, right? Don't turn your foot away from observing the Sabbath. We have a Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, Sunday. Since the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the church has always met on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, to worship the Lord. It is the Christian Sabbath. Here, don't turn away yourself from observing it. Don't take liberties, in other words, to do whatever you please. Don't take liberties to do your own pleasure. It's to be a delight. Not only to reckon it as a delight, to call it a delight, to make it your delight. We're to delight in it. It's a holy day separated from any common use. As soon as anything that was sanctified was used for anything common, it was defiled. It was unclean. Here, this is a holy day, sanctified, set apart. It is to be restricted from any common use. It is to be devoted to the Lord our God. He says... Honor the Lord. Don't find your own pleasure. Honor him. Don't do your own things. Honor him. Don't speak your own words. Honor him. So how would you define your own pleasure? How would that look like in your own life? You've got to define that. To define it for you would be legalism. <laughs> You've got to define that from the word of God. Inform your conscience. Make sure your conscience is well informed from the word of God. And then between you and the Lord, examine yourself and define it. How would you define your own pleasure? Is that involves certain types of recreation? Does it involve certain types of entertainment? TV, movies, your own pleasure. Does it involve sports? What is it that defines your own pleasure? The Lord says, don't do it. Don't do your own pleasure. Don't find your own pleasure. Delight in him. Is that legalistic? No, Isaiah 58 is not legalistic. <laughs> but that's what it says. That's the intent of the Lord for Sabbath observance. Don't find your own, so what are your own ways? I just wanna, you know, sit on my couch, watch the game and eat my chips and not go to the Sunday evening service. I mean, you define that for yourself. What does it mean to not do your own pleasure? 
What about your own words? How about God's words? God's words are being preached here on Sunday night. You have the other six days of the week to inundate yourself with worldly pleasures. But God says, on that day, set it apart to me. Look at the reward from verse 14. If you do this, listen, if you do this, and again, this is God's heart toward this day, to bless you, to love you, to be merciful to you, for you to delight in him. This is for your good. Verse 14, the reward one, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. The Lord is gonna cause you to delight in him by delighting in him. It's an amazing truth of the word of God. Two, I'm gonna cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. Great honor, great strength, great security. That's just security, strength, honor in the Lord. Three, feed you with a heritage of Jacob, your father. That's the blessings of the covenant. The blessings of the covenant. God is going to indwell us with his spirit, cause us to walk in his statutes. He's going to be our God. We're going to be his people. And then it says, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is a promise, a promise. What's the reward of observing this day as holy? That we're going to delight in it, delight in him. That he, God, will be the, the object of our meditations, the object of our thoughts, the object of our speech, the object of our affections, the object of our joy, the object of our pleasure, uh, the object of our hope, the object of our faith, all that on the, on the Lord's day, uh, the object of our ultimate delight. That's what the Lord wants for us. Think about this, get this. The more delight that we take in serving the Lord, the more delight that we'll find in it. There are several here that are not delighting in the work of the Lord. You know how I know you're not delighting in the work of the Lord? Because you're not doing the work of the Lord. But the Lord says, this is a truth from scripture, take delight in the work of the Lord and you're gonna delight in it. <laughs> the Lord's gonna make sure that it's a blessing. The more delight you take in serving the Lord, the more delight you're gonna find in it. So get out there and serve the Lord. Delight, if you're a Christian, that's what we're here to do. We're here to serve the Lord. There's a work, there's a mission that the Lord has given us to do. Let's get out there and do it. You know, one commentator said, if we go about duty with cheerfulness, we shall go from it with satisfaction and shall have reason to say, it is good to be here, good to draw near to God. I can't tell you any time ever that I did the work of the Lord and begrudged doing it or wasn't satisfied in it. The Lord always blesses in that way. Get about serving the Lord and you're gonna find delight in it. We're to devote all our attention to God and his blessings on this day. What's the purpose of all this? Again, the purpose that we should glorify God and enjoy him forever. That we should honor the son who is the Lord of the Sabbath. It's for man's spiritual refreshment. It's for hope in our future rest. It's for man's joy. It's for man's delight, for man's good. And yet for all that, many don't honor the Lord's day. Maybe a reason that because it says in verse 14 that we'll have great security, great honor, great strength, and the second reward there, that we'll have the blessings of the covenant that we'll delight ourselves in the Lord. Maybe that because you may have your priorities mixed up that you aren't delighting in the Lord, that you don't feel strong, that you don't, you're not running on the high heels with God, on the high hills with God, not running in strength, you're not delighting because you're not honoring the Lord on his day, not honoring the Lord on the other six days, especially not on the day that he's purposely said to set aside, to honor him. Maybe the reason that you're weak, you need to rearrange your priorities, rethink what you're doing, rethink how you're serving the Lord and the attitude with which you serve him. Rethink it. Is this legalism? No, this is the, the very opposite. It couldn't be more opposite than a workspace religion. The Lord is saying, don't work, delight in me right? It's the opposite of legalism. It's not to earn God's favor. It's to enjoy God's favor, to be blessed by God's favor. And God's going to teach us to enjoy it through obedience to it. So back in John chapter five, the Lord is Lord over creation. We saw that in John chapter one. He's Lord over life. We saw that in John chapter one. He's Lord over all manner of diseases, all manner of ailments and maladies and all manner of health problems. The Lord is Lord over the hearts of men. We saw that in John chapter two. 
The Lord is Lord over the temple. We saw that in chapter 2 when he cleanses out the temple. He's Lord over worship. And now we see that he is Lord over the Sabbath. We should delight in him. Verse 17 says, But Jesus answered them, My father's been working until now, and I've been working. So while we enjoy the Lord, uh, resting from our labor, so to speak, he continues his work in redemption. And just as he's working, uh, we, while we're here, need to be working. Verse 18 says, Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Never any doubt of that in the Jewish mind. They believed that he was claiming to be God. Not only did they, you know, in other words, somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I'm God. Crazy. And you just keep going your other. But if somebody comes up doing miracles, performing miracles, attesting uh, from scripture, you know, and claiming to be God, the claim has some credibility here. They know it. That's why they're persecuting him for the claim. Never any doubt. They saw here that he claimed to be equal with God. They had already made the decision he wasn't the Messiah. And so they decided that they were going to persecute him. They were going to plot to kill him. He wasn't just a good man. If he's a good man claiming to be God, he's insane. He's crazy. He's deceived and deceiving. But if he's not, if he's just a man, he's not God, then he's crazy. He's a lunatic. But here he claims to be God and he backs it up. That means you and I have a choice. If you're here today, you're not a believer. You have a choice to make. This is God in the flesh. He claims to be God and he backs it up. You need to make the choice to repent of your sins, put your faith and trust in him and follow him because he is Lord of the Sabbath. He is equal with God. He is God in the flesh. But Christian, it also puts us in the position of making a choice. Submit to him as Lord in every area of your life. Turn from sin. Don't fall short of entering his rest. Think about your life. Think about your priorities. Start today. Start today. What is the rest of your day going to look like? Inform your conscience from the word of God. What is the rest of your day going to look like? What are you going to do? And then make those choices on Monday and on Tuesday and then on Wednesday and Thursday. Allow yourself to delight in him by delighting in him, by serving him, by living for him, by trusting him, by reading his word, by taking joy in him. Where will you be tonight? What, what will you choose that you will allow to come before God and his word. Don't willfully reject the Lord's grace to you. That grace comes through a small group, preaching and teaching of God's word. Comes to you through his word, obviously, daily devotions, daily prayer, Bible intake. Comes to you in the help of the Holy Spirit when you battle sin, when you stand for righteousness. There are many, even some here, that profess the name of Christ, but they look like nominal Christians and they are not Christians because there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. And it's because their profession is a sham. They won't submit to the Lord. They won't take delight in him. They take, take delight in their own pleasures, in their own lives, in their own doings, in their own ways. They simply won't delight in the Lord. But here we have every reason given, can you see? John chapter five, the Lord chooses to reveal himself in this encounter with the Pharisees over the Sabbath. And our choices, what we decide to do, what we decide not to do, how we're gonna live our lives, we're gonna trust him, we're gonna delight in him, we're gonna delight in our own doings, our own ways, our own words. So the Lord is gracious, right, to reveal this. We've got to follow the Lord. If we don't follow the Lord of the Sabbath, then we'll enter into a torment, not into rest. That's an eternal, in the same way that the rest is eternal, the torment is eternal. And put your faith and trust in the Lord of the Sabbath, amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this text. Thank you for the way, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us here and help us, Lord, to live according to this truth, to follow you, our Lord, and to delight in you, trusting in you for the expected blessing, the promised blessing that you'll cause us to delight in you. Praise you and thank you for that glorious truth. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.